And now, a passage from Middletown, A Study in Modern American Culture, from Chapter 18, Inventions Remaking Leisure. Although lectures, reading, music, and art are strongly entrenched in Middletown's traditions, it is none of these that would first attract the attention of a newcomer watching Middletown at play. Why on earth do you need to study what's changing this country, said a lifelong resident and shrewd observer of the Middle West. I can tell you what's happening in just four letters. A-U-T-O. In 1890, the possession of a pony was the wildest flight of a Middletown boy's dreams. In 1924, a Bible class teacher in a Middletown school concluded her teaching of the creation. And now, children, is there any of these animals that God created that man could have got along without? One after another of the animals from goat to mosquito was mentioned, and for some reason rejected finally, the horse, said one boy triumphantly, and the rest of the class agreed. Ten or twelve years ago, a new horse fountain was installed at the corner of the courthouse square. Now it remains dry during most of the blazing heat of a Midwestern summer, and no one cares. The horse culture of Middletown has almost disappeared. Nor was the horse culture in all the years of its undisputed sway ever as pervasive a part of the life of Middletown as is the cluster of habits that have grown up overnight around the automobile. A local carriage manufacturer of the early days estimates that about 125 families owned a horse and buggy in 1890, practically all of them business class folk. A regular sight summer mornings was Mrs. Jim B., the wife of one of the city's leading men, with a friend out in her rig shelling peas for dinner while her horse ambled along the road. As spring came on each year, entries like these began to appear in the diaries. April 1st, 88. Easter, a beautiful day, cloudy at times, but very warm, and much walking and riding about town. May 19th, 89. Considerable carriage riding today. July 16th, 89. Considerable riding this evening, people out cooling off. September 18th, 87. Wife and myself went to the cemetery this afternoon in the buggy. Quite a number of others were placing flowers upon the graves of their dear ones. But if the few rode in carriages in 1890, the great mass walked. The Sunday afternoon stroll was the rule. Meanwhile, in a middle town machine shop, a man was tinkering at a steam wagon which in September 1890 was placed on the street for the first trial. The vehicle has the appearance of an ordinary road wagon when put in motion, said the newspaper, though there is no tongue attached. It is run on the principle of a railroad locomotive, a lever in front which guides the vehicle being operated by the person driving. The power is a small engine placed under the running gears, and the steam is made by a small gasoline flame beneath a fuel tank. Twenty-five miles an hour can be attained with this wonderful device. The wagon will carry any load that can be placed on it, climbing hills and passing over bad roads with the same ease as over a level road. The wagon complete costs nearly $1,000. In other cities, other men were also working at these horseless wagons. As late as 1895, Elwood Haynes of Kokomo, Indiana, one of the early tinkerers, was stopped by a policeman as he drove his horseless car into Chicago and ordered to take the thing off the streets. In 1896, the resplendent posters of the alert P.T. Barnum featured in the foreground a horseless carriage to be seen every day in the new street parade with elephants, camels, and all the rest of the circus lost in the background while the crowd cheers the famous Duria motor wagon or motorcycle. The first real automobile appeared in Middletown in 1900. About 1906, it was estimated that there were probably 200 in the city and county. At the close of 1923, there were 6,221 passenger cars in the city, one for every 6.1 persons, or roughly two for every three families. Of these 6,221 cars, 41% were Fords, 54% of the total were cars of models of 1920 or later, and 17% models earlier than 1917. These cars average a bit over 5,000 miles a year. For some of the workers and some of the business class, use of the automobile is a seasonal matter, but the increase in surfaced roads and enclosed cars is rapidly making the car a year-round tool 
for leisure time as well as getting a living activities. As at the turn of the century, business class people began to feel apologetic if they did not have a telephone, so ownership of an automobile has now reached the point of being an accepted essential of normal living. Into the equilibrium of habits which constitutes for each individual some integration in living has come this new habit, upsetting old adjustments and blasting its way through such accustomed and unquestioned dicta as rain or shine, I never miss a Sunday morning at church. A high school boy does not need much spending money. I don't need exercise. Walking to the office keeps me fit. I wouldn't think of moving out of town and being so far from my friends. Parents ought always to know where their children are. The newcomer is most quickly and amicably incorporated into those regions of behavior in which men are engaged in doing impersonal, matter-of-fact things. Much more contested is its advent where emotionally charged sanctions and taboos are concerned. No one questions the use of the auto for transporting groceries, getting to one's place of work, or to the golf course, or in place of the porch for cooling off after supper on a hot summer evening. However much the activities concerned with getting a living may be altered by the fact that a factory can draw from workmen within a radius of 45 miles, or however much old labor union men resent the intrusion of this new alternate way of spending an evening, these things are hardly major issues. But when auto riding tends to replace the traditional call in the family parlor as a way of approach between the unmarried, the home is endangered, and all-day Sunday motor trips are a threat against the church. It is in the activities concerned with the home and religion that the automobile occasions the greatest emotional conflicts. Group-sanctioned values are disturbed by the inroads of the automobile upon the family budget. A case in point is the not uncommon practice of mortgaging a home to buy an automobile. Data on automobile ownership were secured from 123 working-class families. Of these, 60 have cars. 41 of the 60 own their homes. 26 of these 41 families have mortgages on their homes. 40 of the 63 families who do not own a car own their homes. 29 of these have mortgages on their homes. Obviously, other factors are involved in many of Middletown's mortgages, that the automobile does represent a real choice in the minds of some, at least, is suggested by the acid retort of one citizen to the question about car ownership. No, sir, we've not got a car. That's why we've got a home. According to an officer of a Middletown automobile financing company, 75 to 90 percent of the cars purchased locally are bought on time payment, and a working man earning $35 a week frequently plans to use one week's pay each month as payment for his car. The automobile has apparently unsettled the habit of careful saving for some families. Part of the money we spend on the car would go to the bank, I suppose, said more than one working-class wife. A businessman explained his recent inviting of social oblivion by selling his car, by saying, my car, counting depreciation and everything, was costing mighty nearly $100 a month. And my wife and I sat down together the other night and just figured that we're getting along, and if we're to have anything later on, we've just got to begin to save. The moral aspect of the competition between the automobile and certain accepted expenditures appears in the remark of another businessman. An automobile is a luxury, and no one has a right to one if he can't afford it. I haven't the slightest sympathy for anyone who is out of work if he owns a car. Men in the clothing industry are convinced that automobiles are bought at the expense of clothing and the statements of a number of the working-class wives bear this out. We'd rather do without clothes than give up the car, said one mother of nine children. We used to go to his sister's to visit, but by the time we'd get the children shooed and dressed, there wasn't any money left for car fare. No matter how they look, we just poke them in the car and take them along. We don't have no fancy clothes when we have the car to pay for, said another. The car is the only pleasure we have. Even food may suffer. I'll go without food before I'll see us give up the car, said one woman emphatically, and several who were out of work were apparently making precisely this adjustment. Twenty-one of the twenty-six families owning a car for whom data on bathroom facilities happen to be secured live in homes without bathtubs. Here, we obviously have a new habit cutting in ahead of an older one and slowing down the diffusion 
of the latter. Meanwhile, advertisements pound away at Middletown people with the tempting advice to spend money for automobiles for the sake of their homes and families. Hit the trail to better times, says one such advertisement. Another depicts a gray-haired banker lending a young couple the money to buy a car and proffering the friendly advice. Before you can save money, you first must make money. And to make it, you must have health, contentment, and full command of all your resources. I have often advised customers of mine to buy cars, as I felt that the increased stimulation and opportunity of observation would enable them to earn amounts equal to the cost of their cars. Many families feel that an automobile is justified as an agency holding the family group together. I never feel as close to my family as when we are all together in the car, said one business class mother, and one or two spoke of giving up country club membership or other recreations to get a car for this reason. We don't spend anything on recreation except for the car. We save every place we can and put the money into the car. It keeps the family together, was an opinion voiced more than once. 61% of 337 boys and 60% of 423 girls in the three upper years of the high school say that they motor more often with their parents than without them. But this centralizing tendency of the automobile may be only a passing phase. Sets in the other direction are almost equally prominent. Our daughters, 18 and 15, don't use our car much because they're always with somebody else in their car when we go out motoring, lamented one business class mother. And another said, the two older children, 18 and 16, never go out when the family motors. They always have something else on. In the 90s, we were all much more together, said another wife. People brought chairs and cushions out of the house and sat on the lawn evenings. We rolled out a strip of carpet and put cushions on the porch step to take care of the unlimited overflow of neighbors that dropped by. We'd sit out so all evening. The younger couples perhaps would wander off for half an hour to get a soda, but come back to join in the informal singing or listen while somebody strummed a mandolin or guitar. What on earth do you want me to do? Just sit around home all evening, retorted a popular high school girl of today, when her father discouraged her going out motoring for the evening with a young blade in a rakish car waiting at the curb. The fact that 348 boys and 382 girls in the three upper years of the high school placed use of the automobile fifth and fourth, respectively, in a list of 12 possible sources of disagreement between them and their parents, suggests that this may be an increasing decentralizing agent. An earnest teacher in a Sunday school class of working class boys and girls in their late teens was winding up the lesson on the temptations of Jesus. These three temptations summarize all the temptations we encounter today. Physical comfort, fame, and wealth. Can you think of any temptation we have today that Jesus didn't have? Speed, rejoined one boy. The unwanted interruption was quickly passed over. But the boy had mentioned a tendency underlying one of the four chief infringements of group laws in Middletown today, and the manifestations of speed are not confined to speeding. Auto polo next Sunday, shouts the display advertisement of an amusement park near the city. It's motor insanity, too fast for the movies. The boys who have cars step on the gas, and those who haven't cars sometimes steal them. The desire of youth to step on the gas when it has no machine of its own, said the local press, is considered responsible for the theft of the greater part of the 154 automobiles stolen from Middletown during the past year. The threat which the automobile presents to some anxious parents is suggested by the fact that of 30 girls brought before the juvenile court in the 12 months preceding September 1, 1924, charged with sex crimes, for whom the place where the offense occurred was given in the records, 19 were listed as having committed the offense in an automobile. Here again, the automobile appears to some as an enemy of the home and society. Sharp also is the resentment aroused by this elbowing new device when it interferes with old established religious habits. The minister trying to change people's behavior in desired directions through the spoken word must compete against the strong pull of the open road strengthened by endless printed copy inciting to travel. Preaching to 200 people on a hot, sunny Sunday in midsummer on the supreme need of today, a leading Middletown minister denounced automobilitis, the thing those people have who go off motoring on Sunday instead of going to church. If you want to use your car on Sunday, take it out Sunday morning and bring some shut-ins to church and Sunday school.
Then in the afternoon, if you choose, go out and worship God in the beauty of nature, but don't neglect to worship him indoors too. This same month there appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, reaching approximately one family in six in Middletown, a two-page spread on the automobile as an enricher of life, quoting a bank president in a Midwestern city as saying, a man who works six days a week and spends the seventh on his own doorstep certainly will not pick up the extra dimes in the great thoroughfares of life. Some sunny Sunday very soon, said another two-page spread in the post, just drive an overland up to your door, tell the family to hurry the packing and get aboard, and be off with smiles down the nearest road, free, loose, and happy, bound for green wonderlands. Another such advertisement urged Middletown to increase your weekend touring radius. If we accept the concentrated group pressure of wartime, never perhaps since the days of the camp meeting have the citizens of this community been subjected to such a powerfully focused stream of habit diffusion. To get the full force of this appeal, one must remember that the nearest lakes or hills are 100 miles from Middletown in either direction, and that an afternoon's motoring brings only mile upon mile of level stretches like Middletown itself. We had a fine day yesterday, exclaimed an elderly pillar of a prominent church, by way of Monday morning greeting. We left home at five in the morning. By seven, we swept into... At eight, we had breakfast at... 80 miles from home. From there, we went on to Lake the longest in the state. I had never seen it before, and I've lived here all my life, but I sure do want to go again. Then we went to the YMCA camp and had our chicken dinner. It's a fine thing for people to get out that way on Sundays, no question about it. They see different things and get a larger outlook. Did you miss church, he was asked. Yes, I did, but you can't do both. I never missed church or Sunday school for 13 years, and I kind of feel as if I'd done my share. The ministers ought not to rail against people's driving on Sunday. They ought just to realize that they won't be there every Sunday during the summer and make church interesting enough so they'll want to come. But if the automobile touches the rest of Middletown's living at many points, it has revolutionized its leisure, more perhaps than the movies or any other intrusion new to Middletown since the 90s. It is making leisure time enjoyment a regularly expected part of every day and week rather than an occasional event. The readily available leisure time options of even the working class have been multiplied many fold. As one working class housewife remarked, we just go to lots of things we couldn't go to if we didn't have a car. Beef steak and watermelon picnics in a park or a nearby wood can be a matter of a moment's decision on a hot afternoon. Not only has walking for pleasure become practically extinct, but the occasional event such as a parade on a holiday attracts far less attention now. Lots of noise on the street preparing for the 4th, reports the diary of a Middletown merchant on July 3rd, 1891. And on the 4th, the town full of people, grand parade with representatives of different trades, an ox roasted whole, four bands, fireworks, races, greased pig, dancing all day, etc. An account in 93 reports, quite a stir in town, firecrackers going off all night and all this day, big horse racing at the fairground, stores all closed this afternoon, fireworks at the fairground this evening. Today, the week before the 4th brings a pale edition of the earlier din, continuing until the night before. But the 4th dawns quietly on an empty city. Middletown has taken to the road. Memorial Day and Labor Day are likewise shorn of their earlier glory. Use of the automobile has apparently been influential in spreading the vacation habit, the custom of having each summer a respite, usually of two weeks from getting a living activities. With pay unabated is increasingly common among the business class, but it is as yet very uncommon among the workers. Vacations in 1890, echoed one substantial citizen, why the word wasn't in the dictionary. Executives of the 1890 period never took a vacation said another man of a type common in Middletown 35 years ago, who used to announce proudly that they had not missed a day's work in 20 years. Vacations there were in the 90s, nevertheless, particularly for the wives and children of those business folk who had most financial leeway. 
put in bay Chautauqua country boarding houses where the rates were $5 a week for adults and $3 for children. The annual conference of the State Baptist Association, the annual National Christian Endeavor Convention, the annual GAR encampment all drew people from Middletown. But these affected almost entirely business class people. A check of the habits of the parents of the 124 working class wives shows that summer vacations were almost unknown among this large section of the population in the 90s. In lieu of vacations both for workers and many of the business class, there were excursions. Those crowded, grimy, exuberant, banana-smelling affairs on which one sat up nights in a day coach or if a dude took a sleeper from Saturday till Monday morning and went back to work a bit seedy from loss of sleep but full of the glamour of Potoski or the ball game at Chicago. 212 people from Middletown went to Chicago in one weekend on one such excursion. 150 journeyed to the state capitol to see the unveiling of a monument to an ex-governor, a statesman, as they called them in those days. Even train excursions to towns 15, 20, and 40 miles away were great events, and people reported having seen the sights of these other middle towns with much enthusiasm. If you enjoy the content being produced here on the High Americana, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon, which is linked below in the description. Thank you very much.